I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Best Movie You Never Saw, and this week we're taking a look at a Keanu Reeves Al Pacino classic that a lot of people, strangely enough, actually haven't seen, The Devil's Advocate. Tis better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Those iconic words come from John Milton's classic work, Paradise Lost. Milton also happens to be the name of Al Pacino's character in 1997's horror drama The Devil's Advocate. Coincidence? I think not. Directed by the great journeyman director Taylor Hackford, The Devil's Advocate is one of the most underrated films in the careers of Pacino and Keanu Reeves, as well as an early treat in the careers of both Charlize Theron and Connie Nielsen. A modest box office hit grossing $153 million against a $53 million budget coming in second during its opening weekend to I Know What You Did Last Summer. In fact, the weekend that The Devil's Advocate opened, I went to see Bean instead. Yes, the Mr. Bean movie instead of The Devil's Advocate. Good God, what was I thinking? The Devil's Advocate holds a mediocre 63% in Rotten Tomatoes yet consistently ranks as one of the best performances and most iconic of Al Pacino's illustrious career. So, The Devil's Advocate was initially actually published as a novel by Andrew Niederman, former ghostwriter for pulp novelist V.C. Andrews. Whoa, 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 wait a second. V.C. Andrews didn't write all of her own stuff? Niederman approached Warner Brothers selling his story as being about a law firm in New York that represents only guilty people and never loses. Sounds a bit like The Firm, right? Various screenplays made their way around Hollywood, including one pitch that would have featured Brad Pitt in the lead for director Joel Schumacher. It may not have been a great movie, but it would have been sexy. Schumacher even got as far as planning a sequence involving the New York City subway system as a representation of Dante's inner circles of hell. While Schumacher was unable to find the right actor to play the titular devil, the project fell apart. It took the controversial murder trial of O.J. Simpson to kickstart development on The Devil's Advocate, with Warner Brothers hiring Taylor Hackford to direct. Hackford, at the time, was best known for directing The Great Officer and a Gentleman, Against All Odds, also a great movie, and the really, really, really underrated White Knights, starring Mikhail Baryshnikov and Gregory Hines, featuring some amazing dance fighting. It's legitimately a great movie. He was also coming off the critically lauded Dolores Claiborne, starring Kathy Bates and Jennifer Jason Lee. Hackford was drawn to the courtroom aspect of the story, saying, The courtroom has become the gladiatorial arena of the late 20th century. Following the progress of a sensational trial is indeed a spectator sport. And yes, he was right, because at the time, we were all following the O.J. Simpson trial ad nauseum. Every day, there were highlights on CNN. It was talked about in every talk show. I was 16 years old and our teacher actually brought the TV into the classroom so that we could watch CNN and see the verdict read live because it was important and everybody needed to know. Our principal got over the loudspeaker to announce what the O.J. Simpson verdict was. It can't be overestimated as to how important this trial was to pop culture in the 1990s. So indeed, lawyers and courtrooms took on mythical status at the time. And of course, this was also the era of John Grisham, where legal thrillers were all the rage in theaters. Taylor Hackford partnered with his Dolores Claiborne scribe, Tony Gilroy, of the great Michael Clayton and the not-so-great The Bourne Legacy on rewrites. Gilroy is best known, of course, for writing the Bourne trilogy of films and approached his drafts of the script as a variation on the classic tale of Faust. Using free will as a primary theme, the decision was made not to have Milton perform murders, but shepherd events in that direction. They also added that Kevin Lomax, the character that would be played by Keanu Reeves, was actually the son of Satan, a plot element not in the original novel. The Antichrist mythology was certainly inspired by classic horror films like The Omen and Rosemary's Baby, so this would be kind of a horror slash legal thriller. With the script developed, Hackford looked for the leads. Pacino was sought for the role of John Milton despite having turned down the role three times before. Pacino felt earlier iterations of the screenplay made the devil far too cliche and suggested Warner Brothers look at someone like Robert Redford or Sean Connery for the part. 
Pacino finally relented, but only after Keanu Reeves joined the project. And oh my god, was Pacino ever great! Reeves famously chose to star in The Devil's Advocate over this sequel to Speed, a decision that made headlines when it was revealed that he turned down $11 million to appear in Jan de Bont's follow-up to Reeves' breakout hit. And boy oh boy, did time ever prove that Keanu Reeves made the right decision. Reeves passed on Speed 2, leaving that bomb to Sandra Bullock and a poorly cast Jason Patrick after appearing in Chain Reaction, which didn't do very well at the box office, but you know, I thought it was pretty good. He did not want to do yet another action movie, that's why he said he passed on Speed 2. I think he just realized that Speed on a boat is not a good idea. And yes, it is a terrible, terrible movie. So with Reeves on board, the future John Wick and Matrix star took a substantial salary cut so that they could afford Pacino. Hackford also cast Connie Nielsen, then totally unknown in Hollywood, based on her ability to speak multiple languages. They also cast the great Craig T. Nelson, that's right, coach, against type as the duplicitous Alexander Cullen. Production was, for lack of a better phrase, a hell of a time. <laughs> Rumors have long abounded that filming was delayed multiple times due to the dismissal of the original director of photography and assistant directors thanks to Al Pacino's on-set behavior. He's a son of a bitch! Anonymous sources said Pacino and Hackford did not get along. An executive at Warner Brothers claimed that Pacino was often late to work, but Hackford refuted all these claims, and indeed the two have worked together again. They actually just signed on to do a movie together with Helen Mirren and Morgan Freeman, so... Taylor Ackford and Al Pacino probably actually did get along. Filmed in New York City as well as Jacksonville, Florida, The Devil's Advocate benefits from using many churches and courtrooms as well as Donald Trump's penthouse on Fifth Avenue for Alexander Cullen's residence. Donald Trump was supposed to be here tonight, but this is smart to say. Probably George hey. Zuckerman. The design of Milton's apartment was also created in such a way as to foster improvisation. That led to Pacino ad-libbing his performance of Frank Sinatra's It Happened in Monterey at the conclusion of the film. Two memorable aspects of the film also have quite interesting backstories. The shot of 57th Street devoid of people was shot on location on an early Sunday morning which results in an eerie visual. The mural of animated people in Milton's apartment was achieved using actors filmed nude in a water tank in front of a blue screen which was animated. Taking three months and shot at a cost of $2 million, the shot accounted for almost half of the film's entire special effects budget. The sculpture also ended up being part of a lawsuit by artist Frederick Hart, who claimed copyright infringement against his work in the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. While Warner Brothers agreed it was fair use of the designs, a federal judge threatened to delay the home video release of the movie. Warner Brothers settled out of court and half a million copies of the VHS and DVD of The Devil's Advocate had a disclaimer sticker added. With a prequel novel written in 2014, a stage adaptation and multiple attempts to adapt the film as a TV series, The Devil's Advocate remains an example of a big budget studio horror movie with marquee names that does a masterful job of blending genres in unconventional ways. While the film is not quite as scary as other religion themed films, it definitely plays with unique aspects of the concepts of heaven, hell, Satan and the Antichrist. Starting out in the vein of a John Grisham story, Keanu Reeves' Kevin Lomax is a brilliant attorney who has never lost a case. Despite reservations about the innocence of his client, he manages to exonerate him. Offered the chance to assist with jury selection in New York City, Kevin and his wife Marianne, played by Charlize Theron, move to the big city. Now I know the rubes moving on up is a cliche, but in this first screen partnership between Keanu Reeves and Charlize Theron, their dynamic chemistry makes you care more about their journey to excess. As Kevin is welcomed into the inner circle of firm haunch of John Milton, Marianne begins to break down as demonic visions haunt her. Kevin, I'm not crazy. You have to believe me. Oh my God. These visions in the form of fleeting glimpses of horrific faces are well done and just surreal enough to make your skin crawl. Charlie Theron does an admirable job playing Marianne as sexy and endearing, if not a bit naive. At the same time, Keanu Reeves is equally attractive as the young hotshot who's tempted left and right by his new employer. Despite his worst on-screen accent next to Bram Stoker's Dracula, Reeves' Kevin comes across as confident in his skills as an attorney, even if he starts to question what is really going on. The compelling nature of John Milton and what he can offer would be enough to entice anyone, especially when that includes the alluring Connie Nilsson as Christabella. Now, if you were in a film and you had to choose between Charlize Theron and Connie Nilsson, you would likely have a devil of a time yourself, wouldn't you? The devil of a time! 
As the film continues, Taylor Hackford does a hell of a job, a hell of a job, ratcheting up the paranoia through a park attack on Jeffrey Jones's character, Eddie Barzoon, as well as the disturbing and tragic fate of Marianne. There's also a lot of nudity that will make you uncomfortable in the light of its incestuous nature, or maybe not. Still, this is a very sexy movie that culminates in one of the most memorable speeches in film history. Al Pacino is one of the most acclaimed actors of all time. For every Godfather and Serpico, you have Dick Tracy and Shudder, Jack and Jill. Pacino does not do half measures, and that is exactly why The Devil's Advocate works as well as it does. For the entirety of the film, you know Pacino is playing the devil himself, but is masked under the idea that maybe the movie is playing with the audience. Maybe he's not such a bad guy after all. I'm the hand of Mona Lisa's skirt. I'm a surprise, Kevin. They don't see me coming. All of that comes to a head in his monologue about free will. Even if you don't plan on watching the movie, at least check out this one scene as it's a masterclass in hamming it up to the max while still delivering the thunderous intensity that only the best actors in the world can. At the end of the film, the twist of the true relationship between Kevin and Milton is twisted again as the film ventures back and forth in time. Bah, but yet there is another twist that remains. Through all these moments, The Devil's Advocate remains a worthy addition to the shortlist of films about Satan. Don't approach this as a horror movie or a legal thriller, but instead as a story about vanity, greed, and all of the other sins we endure on the road to success. A cautionary tale to be sure, but also one of the most fun movies you'll ever see about the nature of evil. And if you like this kind of program, make sure to click on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company, and we appreciate all of your support.